and welcome to this episode of Spiritual Lunacy. Before I introduce my next guest, I wanted to let all my listeners know that this episode is the last for this season as far as my conversation series goes. I will be back with more episodes of the podcast later, but for the time being, I need a little break. So this is my last uh, episode in the conversation series. And I am truly, truly delighted to have with me Suresh Ramaswamy. What a wonderful way to kind of have a season ending. Suresh is a transformational teacher and entrepreneur. He's passionate about igniting and catalyzing the transformation of humanity. He's also the author of the award-winning book, Just Be. And I'm truly, truly happy and delighted to have him on this episode with all of us. Suresh, I am so, so grateful that you took up the time for this. I can't tell you just how grateful I am uh, that you, you know, even decided to take out time to not just the podcast, you know, you've been so patient speaking to me. I so appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. You are most welcome. You're most welcome. Right. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first question here. Um when I read your book, you speak about your book uh, having its own uh, transmissive quality. And I remember reading uh, that it's all right if you keep the book be- under your pillow as well, it's going to do its work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. See, I'm lazy, I told you. I need all the <laughs> Why do you think I'm starting with that? Um, so initially, I was a little skeptical, okay? Uh, uh-huh. Because I do believe in transmissions, but uh, since at that point it hadn't, uh, you know, I didn't uh, know too much about you, hadn't really, you know, heard you too much except for a little bit. I was like, okay, wait, is it that easy? But okay, I didn't, I don't, I, I read the book on a Kindle, so I couldn't keep it underneath my pillow. Uh-huh. But uh, while I was reading the book, not the first time around, but I know the second time around, something was calling me. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. I guess everything works in its own way, but um, you know, I, I, any book that is coming from a source of uh, light or that consciousness has its own transmissive powers, and I do not doubt that. What well, my question, however, is how can we prepare ourselves to be ready to take in that transmission? Mm. Because one thing is receiving it as well, right? You're serving it somewhere on a platter, yes. but I still need to yes. take it in. Yes. So is that a way to be more receptive to your book? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah, thank you for asking. And and thank you for having me on your podcast. I, I'm really uh, very much uh, enjoy sharing. And I know you have a beautiful audience. Uh, so your listeners, uh, I thank all of you for being here at this moment. And so um, to answer your question, let me start with the little story. So when the book came out, uh, I heard from one of the readers in one of the big cities in India. And she wrote to me that uh, she has a a room where she keeps all her books. And, uh, and she found that something interesting happening, her dog would go into this room, specifically pick up just be in its mouth, Mm -hmm come out of the room and bring it to her and gave it to her um, and it would do this repeatedly specifically just be and she thought this was very interesting and and even took a picture and shared it with me that you know <laughs> this this says something uh, it is something right yeah yeah so here's somebody you know who who who's uh, really picking up on something. And so um, the vibrational element, it can it can be accessed and felt by everybody in, in different ways. And to really get the most out of it, uh, what is ideal is to be in this non conceptual place of connection and trust. So when there is connection and trust, and not necessarily a whole lot of thinking about it, just in being in that space then the vibrations the book you can drink more deeply so um, even if you simply 
look at the cover of the book. Like maybe you're in a in a in a library or a bookstore and you just see the book on the bookshelf. You know, just seeing the book, the cover, the the title, the all the colors, that is itself you're already picking up on the vibration. It's going to start triggering in you something that says, hmm, you know, mm. Or, or, you know, what is what is truth? What is reality? And, and you will you will in your own uh, way you will start picking up on these things. So, um, part of the reason why I mentioned that specifically in terms of the book having a transmission is the begin said the you know at the very beginning the inception of the book it didn't come about because. You know, I had to start, oh, let me write a book and uh, yeah, a book about transformation and growth and evolution and all these things. No, it didn't come out of that. Uh, in fact, I did not want to write a book. <laughs> um, however, uh, the universe had other plans. And uh, in my meditations, I would be uh, nudged towards sharing it sharing these things through in, in, in the written form but i would i would say no <laughs> i would be like i'm happy i'm not like wanting to write a, a book because writing a book is is a, is a you know substantial project on its own now at one time you know it became so strong uh, that i was having this sort of internal dialogue with uh, the non-physical infinite reality and mm -hmm my argument for not writing the book was there's already so many great books you know out there on spirituality mm. consciousness and you know we don't need another book uh it's it's a lot of great stuff out there so uh and i said unless <laughs> i i was uh, in my dialogue i said unless the book inherently has a vibration that can transform the reader and the vibration has to be so high that just being in the vicinity of the book, the reader is benefiting from that. That kind of book, well, that would be good to have, but that's not something, anything I can do much about. Mm -hmm. But that's when uh, you could say light, um, this higher aspect uh, was very clear. It said, uh, you know, I'll take care of that. <laughs> and not only was that conveyed to me but it was shown to me so i felt that vibration what the book would have should i you know work on it and create it so and it was uh it blew my mind at that instant i said i'd be more than happy to work on this book i'd be more than happy to write it knowing that this vibration is being infused into the book by something much much bigger than me and so after that I was very enthusiastic about working on it and and all the things it takes to bring it to life so that's when the vibrational component <laughs> was uh, was born so to speak and and so so it's really I think uh, I feel one of the gifts in the book uh, and in terms of tapping more into it I would say one one thing that readers can consider is to is to visualize the book almost like a radioactive substance you know you know radioactive substance is radiating this and of course radioactivity you know it's a little bit uh, can be uh, not so good but think of this as a positive radiations emanating from the book even though you can't see it with your physical mm -hmm. eyes and this is shifting your consciousness and and it's it's like it's permeating your being so even if somebody for example who has the English version of the book and and they don't know English they can still feel the vibrations right it has nothing to do with the words right. so bottom line is put yourself in a non conceptual place where you connect with the book and through the book to light and just trust that and feel that the more you feel that the more you will be like oh yeah, I can see it's there and it builds on itself. So that's uh, that's some right. those are some thoughts to consider. 
Well, we should thank you, mate. You seem to have made a very good bargain with the higher power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's really. I think it's really. Light wants light's blessings are always being poured out um, on 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 all of us, and it's really. I it, that's what blows my mind. The amount of the abundance of blessings that are being poured down the more we can step into that you know it, it doesn't have to be obviously through my book but just directly even mm. it's amazing it's a whole different world actually um you know something that i really really enjoyed um as i started reading your book was um you had numerous uh methods and meditations in there okay and um like i told you when i picked up the book i was i didn't know much about you so i was kind of one part of it was very skeptical but as i was like you know i mean i haven't come across a book with so many varied meditations honestly and meditations very you know which uh, had been put across in a very simplistic manner in many ways very easy to grasp understand and kind of apply and i saw like um you know you equated your meditations to the elements like you know air water could you tell us a little bit more about that mm okay yeah absolutely um and by the way feel free to jump in and interrupt me as i'm talking uh, i you know no problems with that um so there's you know practices play an important role uh in our spiritual journey uh, there's many sort of contrasting things one one hears about practices uh, you know some say you know this practice is the best practice and this other practice is really very powerful or some people say all practices really are in reinforcing a dualistic separation so really practices are not good for you and 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 you know there's a range of uh, opinions and ideas about practices so we can kind of explore that a little bit one thing i do um early on in the book is i offer a model to understand practices mm -hmm. and that model is the five element model so the five elements are earth water fire air and ether and if you look at these this five element model and how it applies to practices i think you'll get much more clarity about it so starting with earth you know that's typically where somebody says you know i'm i'm really interested in spiritual growth i'm going to practice and i'm going to work on it and so you find a practice that you feel drawn to and you start doing it and you feel like yeah i'm going to wake up at 6 in the morning and i'm going to meditate for 1 hour or whatever it is or do yoga this is you can see that there is somebody who's doing a practice and there's a lot of structure to it there's a lot of details there's a lot of rigor there's a lot of rules uh etc so this is a somebody doing a something which is structured and that's the earth you could say earth element mm -hmm. and that's where we start and it's a fine place to start actually as we keep practicing you know maybe days weeks months go by we find we're stepping into what i call the water element we find that even in the midst of that structured practice we are finding the state of flow so it's mm -hmm. it's as if something is happening suddenly this fluidity and and in you know the structure has some rigidity but in between the rigidity you find fluidity and so this flow kind of feeling which really is is feels very good it doesn't feel hard it feels easy you know that's the first sign uh whereas when you do earth type practices it always feels like oh i got to do this and then oh i have got other things and there's a, a lot of rigidity whereas water flow flow is easy it just happens that quality so you start seeing the water quality inevitably with time maybe it's a little bit here a little bit there but it's there as you continue over the months and years the fire element starts growing 
The fire element is this element where it's like there's a fire burning within you. There's a tremendous enthusiasm for going deeper. Uh, there's a real drive that uh, for higher consciousness. And it's like you feel like, I am ready to do whatever it takes, you know, that kind of feeling. So there's like this very, it's a, it's a strong force that you feel is very much helping you move in the right direction. So you're on fire, basically, for truth, for higher consciousness. It doesn't feel like, oh my God, I got to wake up at six, I got to do this. It doesn't feel like a chore. You're on fire. You feel, you feel it. This is all good, going in a good direction. Uh, as this develops, you start seeing over the years, perhaps, the air element. The air element, as you can see how air is in a room, you know, it's it's like it just is doing its own thing. Mm. Practice no longer feels like practice. It's like so easy. It's like practice just happens. It's like you don't have to try. Yeah. It, so instead of you doing practice, practice does you. You just show up and practice mm. happens. And somebody might say, oh, I saw you, you're sitting there six in the morning meditating. Yeah, it might look like that. But your inner experiences, flow, ease, expansion, uh, freedom, you feel bliss. In other words, it's no longer this clunky pushing a rock up the hill kind of feeling. It's like, ah, mm. everything is so nice, so good, so easy. But you've you know, built up to that. You've refined your consciousness to an extent that now air can be the dominant element in your practice. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, that further leads to ether or space, if you like. Mm. This is sort of the culmination where the practice and the practitioner are both transcended, they dissolve, and what is left is simply being. They're simply being. So it's there's no longer any of that going on. There's nothing going on in a sense. You're just there. And you may it may look to somebody like you're doing certain practices, but but really that's just what it looks like. It's simply you being and so this is the dissolution of the, the the dualistic aspect now it has all become just this one thing so this is as you can see there's an evolution here and so there's no point in arguing one is right and the other one is wrong this is simply how things develop over a period of time so that's the one good important model for practice, understanding practice. There's several other questions that come up related to practices, and maybe I'll, I'll pause here and, and see if you have thoughts about what yeah. I just said. So would you say that we'd all be drawn towards whatever meditation technique is needed by us at a certain point, or is it going to be very linear? Um, okay, yeah. So there's so many practices out there and so many teachings so many teachers so many traditions and they're really i would say very broadly there's many amazing wonderful resources uh, and practices out there um i would say to keep things simple one has to simply see what one is drawn to and trust that so you have to use your intuition at every stage in the game and so what you feel drawn to is a good indicator that maybe that's what's appropriate for you right now yeah. and however it's it's far from linear so there's many many um, things to keep in mind uh, firstly i would say take your time initially to find a practice so don't jump into anything take your time do your own uh, analysis into various things that are out there and find one that you excited to get excited about so don't just think in terms of uh, a spreadsheet and pros and cons and you know these kinds of very uh, linear type of analysis uh, instead see how it feels 
So there'll be some that feel really exciting. In fact, there'll be some that will feel like I cannot stop myself from doing this. This is going to be so good. Now that's a good indicator. That's a good indicator. Rather than just what this person said and that person said, you really feel like drawn to it. So that's a good one. Now having chosen a practice, of course, learn it properly, but then you want to stick to it for a period of time. So uh, that could be months, it could be years. You know, you decide that, but you got to stick to it for a period of time and, and really let that practice deliver the benefits that come with it whatever that practice is. Um, and during that time, you, you don't want to be uh, waking up every week and doing shopping for new practices because this is now mm. messing with your own choice that you made. You're disrespecting your own choice. Uh, you got to honor that choice that you made after careful consideration. Stick to it for six months. Stick to it for a year. Whatever you feel is the right amount of time. After that, sure, then if you feel now I'm ready for something different, then you can consider uh, what other things are available. So I think it, it is there is a place for reassessing every so often, but certainly not every weekend uh, reassessing mm -hmm. you know, and, and trying to uh, switch things and mix things and this and that. That can become a pretty uh, you know it can be become very confusing so there's two common traps uh, I want to mention in this context uh, so one is I kind of already mentioned it that the idea that I'm going to try a new technique or a mixture of techniques every mm -hmm. month and see how it goes and this is uh, not letting any technique do its job so mm -hmm. you are kind of it's counterproductive so avoid that trap. And the other trap can be easy to fall into. Uh, you, you're drawn to a certain practice X and you're drawn to that teacher who teaches X um, and you, you apply it and it helps you. It, it works for you and you, you do it for a year and you can see, you know, it took you from A to B. You can feel this uh, internal expansion of consciousness and you feel like finally I found something that works and I know it works because it actually worked for me and this is all good so then the conclusion I will stick to this technique for the rest of my life now this is the trap because we think that mm. since it took me from A to B it will also take me from B to C C to D D to E etc and that may not be true that may not be true uh, there are techniques and teachers at many levels and they work really well at a certain zone but the, fa the fact that they work there doesn't mean they work all the way to infinity mm -hmm. so you want to be taking a fresh look every so often obviously not every other day but every so often maybe every few years and take a fresh look. Is this thing that actually was great? Is this the right thing for me going forward? So those are a couple of common traps. Uh, and you mentioned my book and there's numerous practices in my book, but mm -hmm. there's really a core practice which I want to differentiate from the many practices that I offer in the book. There's a core practice called Awakening Infinite Radiance or air for short so air is a practice um, that is designed to be done every day so i call it a core practice and it's actually a practice that has four techniques in it to be performed in a certain sequence and it has been designed so that it's balanced and holistic so that it's not one of these techniques that you know it works a little bit here a little bit there it as you develop you will find that the four techniques take you deeper and deeper into pure beingness. And so it's it's designed to, at every stage, give you a balanced development. And, and maybe later I can talk about what, what does a balanced development mean. But uh, it gives you that 
and it's you know it takes 20 minutes to do it so it's actually very efficient and not only is it efficient from a point of view of taking you from the finite to the infinite in 20 minutes but it's also imbued with the vibrational component which we talked about earlier with the book well the this practice also has that component which is very significant because as you get deeper into the practice this component actually starts having a significant effect because you to really break through into higher states of consciousness you need more than just your effort and that that element mm-hmm. is built into the practice so and and you know you normally you think you know i got to sign up for a class i got to pay you know thousands of rupees and go through level 1 level 2 level 3 and then eventually i didn't want to do all that i was like here it is it's all in the book mm. you don't have to go through some elaborate uh, workshops and uh, <laughs> things like that mm. here it is let's see how many people are ready for it which is simple but powerful so awakening infant radiance is what i recommend uh for people to do daily and in addition to that this is where it kind of addresses sometimes you know you feel i need certain kinds of uh, additional components to enhance the practice and there's many practices you can pick from depending on what you feel um inclined to at any given time so you may feel like i want i need to do some emotional release and that might be useful maybe you're going through something and you need that extra help mm-hmm. or you may want to access powerful techniques uh, of accessing light and so there's many techniques for uh, raising your consciousness very high and those might be very appealing at certain points so you got to build a foundation and some of these uh, practices then can be a good complement that you can add for a period of time and then keep changing so you constantly have a, an interesting mixture but you don't have to abandon the approach the approach is still fundamentally based on beingness and light and you can that can be your main sort of uh, um avenue for approaching infinity but within that there's a lot of variety you stick to the core practice and then you can bolt on these other practices mm-hmm. as you feel the need to right No I mean you answered my question which I had like lined up for you after because I wanted to ask you you know normally uh teachers often you know say stick you know, some teachers maybe ha- they have a different approach but usually I think with the at least with most of the traditional techniques I've heard like teachers asking you to stick to one technique because you know try yes. to master one but the mind sometimes you know because either the mind gets really excited it wants to achieve and get to a place so then there's a tendency to keep picking up stuff okay this is great this book is good uh, you know let's pick up some technique from here because uh, after 10 days of especially with the concentrative practices i think you know the mind can get tired yeah. if it's not uh, you know trained in the right way or you know doesn't receive that guidance because there is a lot of mental activity initially to concentrate so uh you kind yeah. of answered that question for me so i get what you're talking about so basically yeah. sticking to the core and then kind of adding on right right yeah i mean i think uh you know there is often times so i talked about you know what does balanced development look like and maybe that is relevant now because what happens is if you pick some technique x and you just stick to it and what happens is that technique x is is probably really good in in some way and this is the key so you will start developing in in a particular aspect of your consciousness and you will keep developing as you go deeper and deeper and deeper which is fantastic however most techniques they are not you know this holistic so what happens is for example some practices are emphasizing transcendence transcendence is basically your you know accessing uh, higher states of consciousness in a way that is going to disregard a lot of the more mundane inputs so you disregard sensory inputs 
and you focus so that you kind of go and you simplify the inner environment so you can go deep this is not unusual um, and so what happens is the transcendence works and that you start transcending more and more however since it's not holistic what happens is during meditation if you do everything just right you can go very deep but outside you're actually still not developed there's a lopsided development that happens and this can keep going on for years and years so somebody is able to go super deep when they meditate but on the other hand the rest of their life their thoughts their behavior their judgment is leaves far to be <laughs> desired mm-hmm. let us say it doesn't reflect the high consciousness that uh, they uh, they they access periodically this is obviously not we, we don't ultimately want to develop in this lopsided way it's actually very expensive ultimately we want to be truly free which means it needs balanced development it means every aspect of your consciousness every aspect of your being has risen and become purified not just a little here a little there so sticking to one technique can has the danger that it could develop uh, things in only one area um with air i have very carefully uh, been inspired to create a set of practices which uh, which really work together so that as you're doing it you're developing in a balanced way so you don't end up with 5 years of doing this and end up in a in a lopsided place which now you have to compensate and you have to do a lot of work uh, that you don't end up with that you end up with every phase of development you are in a good place which is which is really how i think it should be and so what i find is it's not unusual for me to run into people who are at my events or mentoring groups or whatever and they have done 20 30 plus years of spiritual work in various schools various traditions various teachers various practices and they have to come to realize what i just told you that they 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 developed a lot in certain ways but totally not in some other ways so they are now ready to do it in a much more balanced way mm-hmm. so but but i feel like we don't need <laughs> to spend 20 30 years and and start there i think from day one somebody can uh, start there and and in in a short amount of time they can really find that uh, they are at a completely different place than when they started is it actually possible to get that awakening or enlightenment in one lifetime mm. <laughs> oh boy that's a that's a big one uh, <laughs> now there are many um, aspects uh, to my <laughs> response to that but let me start simply that uh, the answer is is really yes um okay here's why the fundamentally who we are you know if you go to the what are, what is our the core of our being you know our essence this essence that we are we 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 discover that through all these spiritual practices and evolution but it's already there so it's not like we will make it and then it will be there Mm-hmm. it's already there it's a matter of discovery so it's let's say you're looking for keys that you lost in the house you, you just don't know where you kept it you're looking you you know the keys are there somewhere right it's not like you're going to construct and manufacture keys the keys mm-hmm. you know it's there all you have to do is find it now is it going to take 5 minutes or 5 hours right it's we don't know <laughs> it, it could take it could take all day to find the keys but you might find it very soon also why because it's already there that's why you can it's you can you can you can find it at any moment so this is similar to us finding our true nature our true nature is already there thankfully this is the really good news i think sometimes we get lost in you know how long is it going to take me 
the good news is it's already there you already have the winning lottery ticket so you just had to find it and so what happens is um there is a a period of of this exploration and discovery to remove all the things that are cluttering and obscuring and distorting our view that's why it takes a while to find it because we can't see clearly imagine if you're looking for your keys and you your um, you know you wear glasses or contact lenses but your glasses or contact lenses you, you just don't have it that day um mm-hmm. now you're looking for your keys and you're not seeing very clearly right and let's say it's also dark okay now you got it's dark you can't see clearly the finding the keys is going to be well it's going to be a little harder <laughs> so it, so this is why finding our true nature it tends to be a little challenging because we're not seeing clearly and it's dark as we but it's still there it's very much there so we have to all do all these practices develop all these understandings etc but to answer your question you can see that can happen that can happen depending on how much we're motivated it can happen pretty quickly furthermore more good news we are not starting from scratch so we are starting where we left off in a previous incarnation so if somebody is listening to this uh you can be sure you're not starting today <laughs> you've been at it for some time and because of that you already have developed quite a few capabilities that you may be taking for granted which is common but these this purification of consciousness that you already have is obviously a huge thing in your favor and that's going to mean that the further steps are that much more easier because you you're you're building on something that you already have so this is why i feel very um confident that somebody who can who really means business they can they can find this they can find it in fact one of the indicators that somebody is far along is this almost exclusive strong wanting for truth for infinity for enlightenment that indicates that they have already set aside a lot of things um the average person if you look at it they have like 20 things <laughs> that uh, that are going on like i got to take care of this and then i got to do this and i got to and oh by the way i'm also very interested in spiritual growth uh, so i meditate every day in the morning that's and and i read spiritual books and which is great but it's like it's 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 one among many things as things develop it becomes the thing it becomes the thing now it does not mean that you have left uh, all your <laughs> ordinary Indeed. responsibilities and gone off into some forest or cave in the himalayas no that's not what i mean when i say it's the only thing when i say it's the only thing in your heart there's a fire burning and that if you were to talk to that fire it says only one thing i am really wanting this truth of my true nature of reality of infinity and i want to be free that's what it says and it it's doing and, and you may be going through all the things you normally do going to school or working taking care of your family all the many things we are doing you're still doing it but your inner fire it has only one thing to say <laughs> it's mm-hmm. only wanting it's burning for this infinite that's the indicator now so that's why i feel when i talk to people when i look at the fire in their heart i feel like okay <laughs> this is there's something good here that this person is on fire now why does it 
the, the, why does it take so long and and it it can take a long time too so i don't want to make it sound like oh it's a piece of cake no yeah. it, it's not it can take a long time so now let me speak to that a little bit <laughs> <laughs> um it can certainly take many lifetimes um and most people it seems like just based on data analysis it does take many lifetimes because mm -hmm. it gets it takes some time for us to get that clarity internal clarity and high degree of consistency coherency and purity that is demanded by truth so just saying yeah i want to be enlightened it it doesn't mean anything because anybody can say that but when you mean it and you mean it when there is all these things i just mentioned a high degree of clarity consistency coherency that statement it's vibrating with that and then the universe is listening not to your words but to your vibrations so it responds it responds so for us to develop that it often takes time because our consciousness if you were to somehow be able to peek into somebody's inner state right in our consciousness mm -hmm. what you see is there's a lot of uh, stuff floating around uh, miscellaneous stuff is floating around this is and that stuff to eat stuff to watch uh mm. things they don't like a few fears here and there and then somebody said something and that's annoying me and so on and so forth there's a whole and then of course things i need to do in the week ahead etc there's a miscellaneous set of things when you start simplifying and clarifying your consciousness which is what meditative practices help you do then there's very little floating in your consciousness your consciousness is clear and it what that clarity does is it gives your aspiration to wake up to to become enlightened it really brings it to the fore it amplifies it and now it is not just a casual thought i have on weekends it is mm -hmm. a burning desire which every breath is conveying to the universe that that's what i want that's the kind of thing which starts bringing about change because then things in our consciousness keep shifting the ordinary person is usually used to a certain state a, a certain configuration of things and they want that to stay stable they feel comfortable and secure in this sense of stability whereas when things are changing we feel a little unsettled and scared where when your consciousness starts purifying there's a lot of things are changing in your inner being so old beliefs old patterns old conditioning these are all changing and that kind of even though it's changing for the better mm. there is flux and that scares us that feels like oh wait a minute <laughs> let's slow things down you know i like it safe and comfortable you know that is a human tendency that we want security comfort convenience these kinds of things you know and we think enlightenment will be like that well enlightenment may not be convenient and it may not be comfortable okay <laughs> so mm -hmm. this is there in the fine print at the bottom of the <laughs> brochure <laughs> that, that, that's a good one that's a good one you didn't start your book with that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you did a yeah. very good marketing trick my friend <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah this is actually for thousands of years you know we've heard about mm -hmm. enlightenment oh that's freedom and that's bliss well who doesn't want that that sounds pretty good you know sign me up well there's there's fine print and the fine print basically says you can't hold on to any of your junk and that is the fine print so the junk is making us comfortable right we don't quite see that we feel like oh what's wrong with this we we want to hang on to our familiar patterns which are all stitched around our identity so it's like custom tailored 
uh, clothing it's it's designed so well for you it fits mm-hmm. you so well so you kind of start liking it you like this feels good to me so all your identity persona habits your history everything you kind of like it you know whether you realize it or not you like i i like this stuff even if you don't like it you actually like it in a weird way um mm-hmm. so we essentially we're attached to that and we don't want to give that up we would like to become enlightened and we also want to keep all these things and that doesn't work and that's why it takes a long time <laughs> that's why it takes a long time because we start letting go of these things and we fight that we say wait a minute i don't want to give that pattern up that's i like that pattern you know and we we hang on to it well now essentially you slow down your process of growth and and that's okay too you can go slow if you like you can go fast if you like uh, but that's why it takes a long long time or it seems that way <laughs> so let me pause here i know you probably have some thoughts around that but actually no i just wanted to ask you know because when i read your book um my first uh, kind of instinct was wow i mean you know i but the first thing i felt was like you know this can be done very quickly okay mm-hmm. and as i kept reading there's one part i was you know actually grinning okay i was like okay now this is where he's likely letting it in that this can take time <laughs> because there are subtle, yeah. subtle hints to that you know yeah. so uh it is no camouflaging that so the, the, yeah. I, i was like okay this is like an honest truth because you know especially when uh, you hear some teachers from the non dualistic space and there's nothing wrong with that i'm just saying that's my interpretation of it sure. it seems to be so simple just watch be aware and right mm-hmm. now you're free and you know i mean mm-hmm. if you, if you ask me like as a lay person they're like you know it's been okay i'm watching am i free no i'm not right so um there is that uh, you know that conflict and so when i was reading your book i was like okay this this is like you know you have that positive optimism it can be done now but yeah. then you also have like the pragmatic part yeah. you know like hey do this can take time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <That's> not- <laughs> you know? yeah yeah so you know another way i would put it is uh, that you know if somebody says how fast can you get enlightened i would say how fast are you ready to let go of stuff that you're hanging on to. And when I say stuff, I'm not just talking about the clothes or your car or your house. No, that's that's the easy stuff to let go of. But your strong beliefs, opinions, ideas, limited constructs within your consciousness, all these things, how fast are you ready to let it go? If you say I'm ready to let it go fast and you really mean it, you just mm-hmm. it's not just a thought. then you will go very very fast that is the limiting factor that is the limiting factor actually um it's not lack of resources it's not uh, meaning resources for um the spiritual wisdom uh, it's not lack of um, blessings from the infinite there is abundance of blessings for all of us mm. So the limiting factor that only you control is how fast are you ready to let go of things which are anything other than truth. Okay, that's mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. Anything other than absolute truth that you're hung holding on to, well that will slow you down. <laughs> so if if you can let go of that fast, you can uh you can get there fast because like I said earlier you know it's it's your essence is already in that immersed in that infinity it's it doesn't have to become something some day it's already there so that's the uh, the encouraging thing you know our destiny is to find that so it's imminent it's imminent that we will find it so it's only how much we can go there you know kicking and screaming as they say mm-hmm. uh or we can make a lot of fuss because when we let go of attachments we can let it go very simply and easily with a lot of grace or we can make a big fuss about it 
So if we make a big fuss about it, then we'll have a very drama, uh, <laughs> dramatic <laughs> uh, growth pattern, right? Every little thing we make a big fuss out of it. So then it's it feel feel very turbulent, bumpy, and we feel like, boy, why is enlightenment so difficult? It should be easy, you know. Well, we are making it difficult. We don't see that. <laughs> Nobody else is doing that. It's just you know, how we choose to engage with it. So this is also where light comes into the picture, which I think, uh, you know, we can get to at some point. But I feel that if I look at my own journey, the element of light can dramatically change how we traverse the path. Um, It's a much, I would say, cleaner, smoother, more elegant way to enlightenment and and, you know the word enlightenment has light built into it right enlightenment you know it doesn't have to be that the the light is only when we get enlightened i mean the light is Mm -hmm. is very much there throughout and enlightenment you can think of as the fulfillment the completion becoming fully you know into the light but throughout there's much light and it can help us in incredible ways and just asking for it would be enough, right? Uh, so. Yes, so that's right. Increasingly engaging with light, connecting with light, working with light. Uh, in my book, I also have specific practices you can you mm-hmm. can uh, use to more deeply connect with light. Um, but very simply, yeah, it's just having that intention and having some understanding. Um, so in the middle of my book there's a chapter called infinity and the fields of light and I talk about the nature of infinity and the nature of reality as being nothing but light so it's the fields of light and having some of that understanding helps because then we we kind of have this more full picture of the light and that, that is very motivating and inspiring so I think that helps us too to say why you know why should I be thinking about light and what how does it work and things like that. Right. You know, so, uh, one quick question regarding this. You know, some of your meditations. I mean, they have a most meditations do, but yours especially. Like they have a strong imaginative element to it, like where you imagine the light entering your body, and you know. Uh, imagination is an imp- important aspect. The reason I'm just putting this, a lot of people cannot always imagine. and Or maybe like, you know, in some meditation sessions, the imagination is stronger as opposed to another session where one is just not being able to imagine light or mm-hmm. anything. Mm-hmm. Um, in in that scenario, um, you, you know what I mean? Is it like, uh, how important is it to have like a strong imagination? Mm. Or it's okay if you're not able to imagine as well? Yeah, I love this question. Yeah, well, great question. So, I would like to start with just how we think of imagination. Um, ordinarily, we have the sense that there's reality, right? And reality is real. And imagination, which is like, yeah, whatever you kind of dream up, you know, it's just whatever. It's not real. And so we have the split, real and imaginary. This is problematic because imagination, in the way I think about it, is actually much more than just a fanciful thought. Imagination is actually the power of our mind to be able to tap into non-physical realities, which are not perceived by the senses just yet so it's it's actually something that is real but not apparent Mm. this is a big difference so in fact higher intuitive abilities they in fact require some degree of imagination because we allow ourselves to feel into something that that we you know we can't quite Put our finger on it it's it seems like very nebulous it seems imaginary but it's there it's just non-physical it's higher dimensional so imagination don't think of it as a this kind of just you're making things up 
imagination is you're allowing yourself to step into higher dimensions so this is why I use it extensively in my practices because it you have to relax and let go of this stronghold on physical reality so you can now step into something higher and so to evoke that higher state you use imagination now imagination can take several forms so some of us might visualize it and visualize it visualization is one form of imagination because we are using images to imagine but imagination is not limited to images you can have abstract thought which is also imagination but it does not necessarily have a visual component to it you can have auditory imagination again no image but you can feel and you can have a texture the higher consciousness is a texture that you can feel and you cannot necessarily see it in, in as an image so the reason I'm breaking it down this way is each one of us is a little different in terms of our ability to visualize some of us have strong visualization abilities great mm -hmm. but if you don't you can tap into some of these other ways to imagine things so sort of some of us can feel into it but we can't quite explain anything it's just a feeling sense perfect I think that's one that if that's your strong point use that uh, if you're able to um, sense it in other ways including like I said texture or any other way even very abstract then for instance I myself uh, abstraction is very comfortable to me with with no uh, sense of uh, does it have to have a shape a form a color no just pure abstraction I mean I feel very comfortable with that so somebody like that can use abstractions to get there so end of the day you can take any of the things that I mentioned in the book adapt it so that it works with your strengths and essentially you're able to step into that space that is the key right that is the key so sometimes I might say visualize but you can use whatever sense is most easy for you to you know uh, use mm -hmm. and then you find that this imaginary component it starts out like I don't even know what this is but as you get into it you start noticing that now it's actually not so imaginary you can feel it now it's like wait a minute I can feel this light I can feel the pressure of light I can feel this sort of incredible intensity of light it's no longer imagination at that point so imagination kind of helps us get there but then very soon that is just your you know now it's <laughs> it's what you're seeing just like that you know i'm kind of tempted to get into lucid dreaming okay. um because it, uh because from this thing of imagination that's what popped up yeah um so you have um, talked about lucid dreaming in your book and not from the space of uh, trying to manifest or anything. So I'm not going to go down that road at all. Because yes. Not because it's good or bad or anything, but the purpose here is something else. But how it is actually a very powerful tool to kind of, you know, strengthen one's consciousness or awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think everybody has experienced lucid dreaming. Everybody has sometime or the other been awake in their dreams or, you know, that midday kind of noon time uh, there's that or that when we are waking up in the morning early morning there's that half sleep kind of a thing uh -huh. around that time also you know uh, when we're in that half sleep mode there is the tendency for the mind to imagine and create things in that half awake state uh -huh. right yeah. so um you know like and we usually kind of play along with uh, whatever we desire or maybe like you know something around that uh, space where we start imagining i mean i think everybody's had that little moment like before like the strong dream moment or when they're waking up where you start you know kind of imagining uh, 
a situation for yourself, maybe that you're walking into a dream job or something like that, something random like that just, just, just popped up. But um, that space um, of imagination, when we are like in that lucid dreaming space, are we actually creating those vibrations there? Or is it, uh, um, I don't know if I'm phrasing it accurately, but something even like a random thing, like, you know, our desires, when we're imagining it in that space, dream space, is it like something we are actually kind of, uh, you know, is it something that already exists? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, it's a fascinating topic, actually, lucid dreaming. And I think what you mentioned, I want to underscore that a little bit, which is mm -hmm. lucid dreaming can be used for various purposes, um, mm -hmm. including entertainment. Uh, but for me, what is absolutely fascinating is using lucid dreaming f to accelerate your spiritual yeah. growth, because that's a very specific application of lucid dreaming, which I feel is heavily underutilized by spiritual practitioners, that uh, it's, it's, hard, it's not used as much. And there's a lot of amazing cool things you can do uh, in your lucid dream so first of all you know in, in case it's brand new to somebody I just want to mention that lucid dreaming is essentially just like you have dreams at night but imagine during the dream you are have an awareness that you are in a dream so you are your part of you is you could say awake you know this is a dream so that's what lucid dreaming is and what you were talking about uh and th that's you know there's the hypnagogic state the hypnagogic state is you know as you're drifting to sleep mm -hmm. or also when you're coming out of sleep you are like half half here half there that's the hypnagogic state um which is you know i would say i would differentiate that a little bit from lucid dreams where okay. lucid dream you are you know well into the dream but you are clearly lucid you're awake um and so getting into what you asked now about lucid dreams so there's there's degrees of lucidity degrees of awakeness uh, and as you practice this and develop this ability you will be increasingly more awake and the more awake you are the more there is interesting possibilities because you can now participate more actively in the dream so otherwise the dream is just happening and you're just watching it and as you become more aware you can um, sort of navigate it and you can shape it also in various ways um, so if somebody asks you know is that something real if i were to you know conjure up something in my lucid dream is that real or is that you know what's really going on well you know if you think about it if you let's say last night's dream there was a wild animal chasing you uh, was that real or not well i would answer in a strange way i would say it's real because when you were being chased you know it was right there you know nipping at, at your <laughs> you and your your heart rate and you were like full of fear you're like am i going to make this and you know is it going to happen you were not like i wonder if this tree is really a tree you know, you're running as fast as you can it, it's real it's as real as anything else uh it's only later on we may wake up and we may say oh that was just a dream and you know the reality is all of this is just a dream actually so there's no such thing as real it's all a dream so there is nighttime dreams and there's daytime dreams <laughs> in the daytime dream you wake up get you know get dressed go to work drive a car you think that's real that's just a daytime dream so the beauty of lucid dreams is you start seeing this thing that at night you wake up and you have a lucidity that lucidity spills over into your daytime and this is the remarkable thing you start seeing that 24 hours you are in a dreamlike state and the lucid dreaming exercise was just the beginning to make you see that 
there is lucidity and dream dream state everywhere in the entire day so the, the so the to go back to your question the 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 fundamental things start changing like am i really making this up well everything is made up everything is dream so where do you draw the line <laughs> right it all starts looking pretty amorphous nebulous and abstract it's like everything is all cooked up everything is cooked up so it's all very fascinating so now you can start living from a different place you you start looking at reality as being very fluid previously we think of it as very rigid you know my boss is like this and this is how it is and unfortunately this is my reality you start seeing everything is very fluid and you are able to when things are fluid you can operate very differently in fact this is a state where this is one indicator of your consciousness getting rising as your consciousness rises everything starts looking fluid previously everything looks very stuck very calcified very problems look intractable it feels like oh boy this this thing is never going to change let me tell you it's hopeless mm -hmm. so everything is like very bad and it's not going to change that kind of feeling whereas when things are fluid you feel like everything is changing anything can change any time that and and you you can feel it so this state actually when you are in that state you feel you'll see that reality also responds it's also more fluid and it's 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 quite an interesting thing to start living that way and so lucid dreaming i would say you know there's so many things to say about it but this is hopefully opening your eyes to wanting to look at that a little bit more and seeing what in the world is lucid dreaming all about i hope you you look into that more and 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 i'm speaking to the listeners here and um, and explore it and see how you can do amazing things for example you may have thought i can do on you know my meditation and spiritual practices only you know morning and evening when i have time well guess what in a lucid dream you can start meditating you can do your practices in in your lucid dreams uh, let's let's look at another practice which is emotional release which is very important we have trapped emotions you got to let them go you can release your emotions in your lucid dream and when you do that it's even more powerful than if you do it during the day because in the lucid dream things are extra fluid they're extra fluid so your efforts to release trapped emotions are more effective they're more impactful but you have to get to that lucid state <laughs> you know to do that so it, it that's some of amazing. it it sounds easy but it's actually a you know a tough little technique so to say to get into that space consciously yeah i would say realistically uh, plan on a few weeks to a couple of months to get the hang of it to start getting into the lucid state if you consistently try for several weeks continuously uh, you will start uh, noticing you are getting into the lucid state so it's not like super hard it requires consistent effort and once you get into it then of course you can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper if for everybody is listening you know when you pick up sureshis book like uh, he has like a section on lucid dreaming and actually like how you can uh, kind of uh, uh, get into that practice simple thing like you know sometimes setting an alarm for like a time where you wake up mid in the middle of the night yes. so you can again get back you know simple things like that so we I'm not going to get into that with Suresh right now you should read it in the book but uh, like he rightly like said i mean not many teachers talk about it but it is really really like quite a state and that's uh, something i really maybe we can have a different discussion on that sometime much later because it's an endless kind of sphere as well <laughs> sure yeah absolutely absolutely there are so many fascinating topics to talk about and yeah, yeah. absolutely we can definitely do that so are you noticing how i'm like just throwing one thing and like you know cornering you one more one more <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to move on to the last bit, maybe at least for this chat right now, where um, you have like a very interesting part called the infinitude accelerator. Okay. Yeah. And um, you have three stages in it uh, where you talk about transcending integration and then embodying it. And not again, you know, this is not very common where like people, people are always talking about like the meditation processes and stuff. But after where maybe awakening has started creeping in or things like that, or basically consciousness growing or whatever one wants to term it as that. Um, um, often not many people talk about it. It's usually like, a, you know, one to one teacher disciple talk. But I found this really interesting. I thought like, um, obviously, you're not talking about these stages as linear to begin with. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you talk about like, you know, transcending maybe, and then the integration slowly happening, um, is does the transcending or like the moment of awakening, is it like a big move? Or it could be small moments and like uh, small shifts and often people not noticing the shift and then an integration happening. Mm. Uh, you yeah. understand what I'm trying to Absolutely. Think? Yeah. Or yeah, totally. Yeah. So, yeah. So there are these three big phases uh, that I identify in you know, transcendence, integration and embodiment. And I feel like even knowing that these three phases exist is very important for spiritual aspirants because there are quite a few traditions and practices which are overemphasizing transcendence. So people almost don't even work on integration until much later. And then it's it can be a little precarious because uh, you can have a significant awakening, but there's a lot of integration work to be done. And it can be very confusing. You feel like, oh, I'm already awakened, but actually you're you've got a lot more work to do. <laughs> so and and this kind of I feel like is unnecessary to get into these kinds of weird states. In fact, if you look at how nature intends it, and this is how I intuit it, it's really a more organic, balanced development throughout. So you were you would have some transcendence happening and then you would also do some integration so you, and then you do, do some embodiment so you are actually having these mini transcendence mini integration mini embodiment uh, going on like every day every week every month so at any given time you're actually in a in a, in a well balanced place and so i think to answer your question yeah there could be like a mini awakening followed by a mini integration and i think that's actually highly desirable the beauty is when it develops like this at any given point you feel very solid and stable and you don't feel wobbly you know there are there are um, people who get into these very imbalanced states where there's too much energy or too much ungroundedness or lack of integration with the daily life uh, which shows up in many ways problematic relationships difficulty with managing emotions difficulty with managing money and all these practical types mm -hmm. of things it is very hard when, when you're not in a balanced integrated state so y you essentially are preempting all that kind of thing if you follow this model and have a good set of practices so i think it, so to answer your question it's actually a very desirable thing to be having these mini uh, all of these things mini awakenings mini integration mini embodiment and in fact it's uh, even when one gets to a very advanced state mm -hmm. uh, whatever that is you find that it feels very natural and ordinary that is a good sign because the state of being as i refer to it as this 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 ultimate state is state of pure beingness it's not this special extraordinary you're flying in the sky bliss mm. state no that is a peak experience a lot of people confuse peak experiences you know somebody went up the mountain had an amazing experience got enlightened came back they think oh they, they did it that is not <laughs> truly 
uh, the state of your beingness. They, they, that's a great peak experience. Peak experiences always come and go, and they are not the real thing. They are, they are nice to have, but they're hardly the real thing. So the real thing, actually, if you've developed in a balanced way, is the state of your beingness, where it feels very ordinary, very natural. And in fact, so much so that we may easily overlook it ourselves or even in another person uh, that this is what's going on. So we, we still, I think, as a, a planet, we are still evolving towards our understanding of what that really looks like because you hear so many different versions of that and it can be pretty confusing. Right. And you know, this um, transcendence and embodiment that you're speaking about, we, of course, I'm taking it from the reference from like, you know, the energy pattern, but what about the physical body? Does that also naturally align or is sub one supposed to do something? Hmm. Okay, yeah. So the, the higher states are not just sort of states you achieve in consciousness. So in fact, the uh, implications of a true awakening, they cascade through our entire being. So uh, our, our, the light aspect of our being, the energetic aspect of our being, and yes, the physical aspect of our being, they all have to be vibrating and elevated to accommodate this state of consciousness so they all have to be aligned and so then the the sort of um, the 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 question that comes up is what does that look like you know what does it look like so um, so just to say a little bit about it in fact the subtitle of my book is transform your life and live as infinity so that live as infinity is is that which is where all aspects of your being are aligned with infinity and you're living as infinity, you're embodying infinity. So we might say, what does it actually look like? Well, firstly, physically, I mean, the body, the physicality, the biochemistry of the body is significantly enhanced. So all the metabolic processes, uh, the neural processes and the digestive processes, everything is is now driven by higher consciousness so it is much more optimized and much more aligned with the blueprint of how the body is supposed to work so in other words deviations from the blueprint are are resolved they are they are essentially neutralized and now you are more in alignment with your blueprint in terms of what it looks like from the outside is the person doing something or are they just sleeping all day well <laughs> they are they meditating all day that is another uh, common misconception they must be just sitting in a cave and meditating all day and just blessing people <laughs> it's well it can look like anything it can look like a school teacher who's teaching you know second uh, standard children it can look like a painter it can look like a policeman it can look like anybody on the outside. So in other words, the role is not, it doesn't have to look like a spiritual teacher by any means. It can look like anything. Um, and so the, the outward role is, 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 is uh, not limited. It can be a parent, it can be a caretaker, whatever. Um, this person is still functioning, you know, and they're functioning and they're functioning in an optimal way. So the actions they are taking and this is the key. They are taking actions, but the actions are springing from beingness. So they are abiding in a state of beingness, and anything they do is coming out of that beingness. And those actions could be anything. It's not, uh, we can't say it's X, Y, and Z. It could be anything. Um, and it can look pretty ordinary. It doesn't mean this person is, you know, all, you know, all these people are winning Nobel Prizes in <laughs> various fields or any such thing. They could be a very ordinary farmer who yeah. nobody's ever heard of, who's never written a book, who doesn't talk about spirituality, but they could be that, right? So this is, you know, it can look like absolutely anything. Yeah. 
Suresh, Suresh, thank you, you know, for this wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, an hour that you spent with us. But before I wrap up, uh, for everybody listening in, Suresh will be in India around uh, November and he'll have a retreat here. You can get more details on his website and I'm going to add his website details in the description box for the podcast. So please check that out. He is going to be here in November. So you can get to meet him then and you can get the description from my podcast description box. Um, Suresh, I know you're always kind of sending out light. I can feel it when I speak to you, but a special request to send it out for all the people listening today. Mm. Um, I think we all need it so much. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, let's spend a few seconds right now actually um, focusing on that and uh, just as you're listening to this just drop everything simply open up relax receive the blessings of light are just pouring down on you and let that light work its magic in your life beautiful and uh, so th thank you all for being here and thank you Nandita for inviting me that's a real treat and as you mentioned uh, i will be in bangalore in november and uh, around mid-november i'll be offering a retreat in, in the bangalore area so stay tuned uh, everyone for that and feel free to connect with me through my website um, and I, I look forward to hearing from many of you uh, i always love hearing from sincere aspirants so thank you and you should really pick up his book and, you know, maybe then have a conversation with him. You can you know, drop him an email. Uh, he has that in his book as well. So I would really recommend you do pick up the book. Uh, Suresh, thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you could take our time for this. Honestly, I am going to get you in, like, hopefully for another session where there's so much to talk about because this could go on endlessly. <laughs> Yes, thank you too. It has been a joy and I very much look forward to future conversations as well.